Run! Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today I've got Cliff Gray of Flat Tops Wilderness Guides. Cliff, how you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on again, Jay. Yeah, for sure. It's a busy time of year for you. Uh, we're uh, a couple days before the first rifle season in Colorado. Um, before we get into that, Cliff, why don't you give me a little bit of a background on you and your operation for those for those of you listening i've done several podcast episodes with cliff but uh uh, for maybe some new listeners uh tell me what you got going up there yeah so uh uh so it's the name of my outfit fly tops wilderness guides and uh, most of my business is elk hunting in uh in two over-the-counter units uh in colorado 25 and then 24 um I do. I would say most of my business is in the rifle seasons, and, and it sounds like that's what we're going to talk about. And then uh, outside of that, I do a fair amount of archery in September. Um, I do some some goat and sheep hunts for some. I guide for some other outfitters also in September, and that's kind of the lay of the land. Um, in terms of our rifle stuff, uh, it's all in re, in a remote area. It's in the wilderness area, and it's all horseback stuff. Um, and then I'd say nowadays I'm about half my business is guided during rifle seasons and then half of its drop camps. Gotcha. And, um, how, how is the weather in Colorado? You're, you're in, uh, best way to describe it to people between Glenwood Springs and say Eagle, uh, roughly. Uh, and how has the weather been, uh, so far leading up to the first rifle season in Colorado and maybe compared to uh, history and compared to other years, is it much very typical or is it uh, anything abnormal? You know, I would I would say it's pretty typical if you look at like the short term in terms of like the last two or three years. It seems like we're ha- still kind of having these mild falls, um, particularly this year with the later dates. You know, like last year I was uh, you know we're we were almost done with first season right now. Um, so we're kind of a week week off. So I would anticipate like colder temperatures, um, having you know more snow accumulation up on the top, that sort of thing. But uh, and it looks like actually for the next eight or nine days, it's going to be it's going to be pretty nice. So I would say that in the spectrum of the last two or three years, it seems to be like a new norm. But you know, uh, outside of that, typically by mid October, above ten thousand feet, we have a, a like you know, a fair amount of snow that's, that's not going to leave. Um, that being said, it's just volatile, Jay. Um, it's really, it's kind of one of the hardest seasons to describe to people in terms of gear and that, because, um, like this year, I would guess looking at the forecast, our lows are going to be, you know, I'm, I'm guiding guys at 11,000 feet and I've looked at the lows up there and it's probably going to be 15, 20 degrees. And then my highs are going to be like close to 60. Um, but in the, you know, and that can change in a couple of days, and all of a sudden you can have single digits, and then it never get above, you know, close to freezing. So it can be very volatile, and then snow accumulation, the same thing. Even more wild swings, I would say, in that on that front. Um, you know, middle of October, you can get two feet of snow pretty much, you know, at any in just a, a day and a half or so at those high elevations. Um, and like just as an anecdote on it you know two weeks or let's say not even a week ago in my high camps i had about 10 inches of snow and it's already all gone so it's kind of that time of year where there's no there's no norm you know the the when you get into second and third season i mean the norm is above 10,000 feet in even like the last in the last couple mild falls we've we've had, you know, a solid foot of snow above 10,000 feet, which helps the elk coming from the, it doesn't move the elk, but it helps you know where where they've been and helps you kind of track them a little bit on, on that front. That was going to be my next question. Um, what does it take to move those elk? You said you had, ten, uh, you know, 10 inches of snow or a, I believe you said 10 inches or a foot of snow um, already at 10,000 feet and it's melted off. Uh what does it take to move those animals down to lower elevations? I know I actually got a call yesterday from a guy that's uh, going on his first Colorado elk hunt. He's actually doing second season, and he was asking me a lot of questions as far as 
you know, where, where will the elk be? Uh, when will they start to move? What does it take for them to move? I was wondering if you could speak to that. You know, uh, yeah, I can. It's a, it, to me, it's like a much more in-depth topic than people kind of, kind of, uh, talk about on it. Um, because I found particularly in our area already at this point, like after your archery pressure in these over the counter units, your some of your elk have already moved. Like there's there's elk low right now. Um, some of that's already on private, some of it's in the lower public land. So they almost like they, they go to two different populations. They go up up higher and they go to the real hellhole places on the on the public public accessible or they run to the private, or kind of in the real nasty stuff down low. So that's more pressure-related movement. Your snow, I mean, the reality is in our area, snow the snow won't move the elk until it's essentially belly deep. Um, so it's like a, it's like a feed-related thing. Um, and I think that we're probably the extreme in that case because we have a lot of south-facing exposure where your wind blows your blows your you know your slopes off where they can still get the feed. So in my experience here and we seem to be the on the extreme on that. I mean, I've been up in November at 10 5 11 feet where like my horse is almost chest deep in snow and I'll cut elk tracks. So it's pretty extreme and I think it's probably just because in the over counter units they know um that you know, I mean, they're just, they want to stay out of the pressure as much as they can, and that high country is the way to do it. Um, so, you know, when guys, you know, a foot, um, 18 inches of snow, it's good. Um, you want to ha- you want it to happen before your hunt, though. You know, you really don't, you don't want blizzards during your hunt. They, I mean, it's not, it doesn't help you on your hunting front, right? It just limits the time you can get out there. There's no use in hunting and whiteout conditions and that sort of thing. So, you know, if you get a couple feet or, like, let's say from a foot to two feet, it's not – the elk are not going to just start dive bombing out of the high country. Um, but it will help you hunt them because you, you can, you, you know, you can see where they've been. You know, and that's, and that's one of the things I would say in all over-the-counter units – people get snagged up on and they waste a lot of their time looking at sign that they don't realize is actually, you know, a week old, a week and a half old. And when, particularly when you get second and third season where almost all these elk have been shot at, um, you, you got to be hunting fresh sign or hunting like where you're seeing elk. That makes sense. Um, it Take that one step further and what does it do to the deer um, as far as you got some snow at 10,000 feet, now it's melted off. Are the deer the same way in that they will wait till it's, you know, up, up, to, their, up to their bellies and, and they'll move? Or, or are they more of a migratory and they will move uh, uh, sooner? So, yeah, I, I have a good family friend who's a, who's a, a well-known ungulate biologist, and I've talked to him a lot about it. And basically the deer, the deer move on photo period from his perspective, like when they do research on them, with the exception of is they're much more sensitive to snow. So if you don't have snow like we've had where, you know, even last year into the 6th, 7th of November, I didn't have very much snow in the high country, the deer still moved. But if you have two feet of snow up high, regardless of the, when it is, it could be right now or it could have been a week ago, the, elk, the deer will move. They just and I and I my guess is Jay that it just has to do that do with the fact that they just can't they can't get to the feed like the elk can, um, so they'll move on 18 inches two feet of snow, uh, and and I've actually even noticed that they will come down and if it melts off they'll go back up like you know not not like not like 10 miles sort of thing but a mile and a half they'll come off a ridge and then if it melts they'll show back up um, and then you know, that the the last week of October when that photo period kicks in and then they start thinking about the rut, they all come down based on that. Now, if you get these, you know, a huge snowstorm in October, the deer are going to be down here and they're going to stay down low permanently. Um, that That's the experience that I've, I've seen with them. They're much more susceptible to getting pushed by snow than elk are. Okay. 
Um, you brought up another good question for me, and that's feed. Um, both elk and deer. What are your elk feeding on right now? And will that pattern change as the season progress? Meaning, is there a certain type of feed that, that guys that are headed to Colorado this weekend should be looking for? And, and then does it change or are they pretty much eating the same thing throughout all of these seasons? Yeah, so I, I wouldn't classify myself as like an expert of what they're, you know, what they're actually feeding on. I, there, I assume some of that might change, Jay, but... From my experience hunting them, the only difference is, and we hunt big open meadow country, so essentially anything that you would think like cows would eat, like cattle cows, that's where you're gonna, that's what elk are, are eating. Basically, if there's high green grass, right, um, in our meadows is what they hit. The transition that I see mostly is that once there's gun pressure, a lot of that goes nocturnal, right? or almost all of it. So you're not going to catch them as much in meadows grazing, you know, out in the open. So I don't notice a big difference. The thing, the, and then um, the deer, the deer, you know, they essentially, in our area at least, it's different type of habitat. We have kind of oak brush, south-facing stuff where they're hitting, you know, more of that, uh, the shrubbery kind of kind of stuff. I can't remember the word for it right now. But um, so that, right. I don't see a big change either. But I will say on the elk, it's more of a behavior of when they when they feed. And then going back to the weather question is even if you don't have big snow accumulations, if I have really frigid cold temperatures, all of a sudden both the deer and the elk are eaten just more during the day because they have to get out. To me, low low temperatures are almost better than snow when I'm at, when I'm elk hunting. Because it just it. I, it it makes them feed. It makes them feed. Uh, they have to eat, and, and from a certain sense, they get out and feed because they have to to keep their metabolism, keep their body, and everything moving. Right? Yeah, exactly. It, so, and that's the biggest thing, particularly in these over-the-counter areas, is your your deer and your elk. They timber up bad, like, and they only they'll only come out at night. Like you you go through meadows that are that are heavily trafficked. Um, by you know by hunters and and riders and everything else, and you'll see fresh elk sign, but you're not going to kill an elk in there unless you know it's freezing cold and they've got to start eating longer into the daylight. You know, so that I've noticed that. But the other thing I've noticed is that if I'm just glassing timber that I can partially see into, if it's a cold day, I'm more likely to catch them get because they'll get up. You know, they'll get up and they'll try to feed in the timber and then they'll go sit down again and disappear. Um, so just in general, when it's colder, I'm able to pick them up more, you know. Um, and so that, to me, that helps, that, that helps just as much as snow does. And what do you consider, for the listeners out there, what do you consider like great, you know, cold, crisp, like good feeding, like you, you see a certain temperature for the coming week and you're going to be like, oh yeah, it's going to be on. What kind of temperature range are you looking for? Yeah. I, like I'm saying like days where the temperature doesn't get above 10 degrees. Okay. So really cold. Yeah. I'm talking cold, cold. And you usually don't get them in October. Usually like this year you can get those kind of days, you know, second season runs into November a little bit. Those first two weeks in November, you, it's, it's not uncommon for temperatures at night to be negative 10 degrees and then, you know, during the day never pop above 10 degrees. Um, so, f like, frigid by most people's standards. For sure. Um, I, I heard you say something about when you're glassing, <clears throat> you kind of like to find areas where you've got timber but that you could actually, not the dark timber that you can't see into, uh, but, but some timbered areas where you can be across on a ridge where they feel like they've got shelter, um, but you actually can see into those areas and you pick up elk uh, feeding during the day. Um, it, are those areas that you look for, uh, you know, as prime areas to, to be able to kill an elk where you know, the, the dark timber is, is your worst enemy, the hunter's worst enemy, and the elk's best friend. Right. Uh, 
tell me about kind of trying to pick areas or or maybe traditional areas that you guys hunt all the time because you know that the elk will get in there they'll feel safe they'll be up and feeding um talk to me a little bit about that yeah so there's there's two areas and like so I'll, and I'll give you like a little a little color on my strategy for for this year because and it kind of goes back to the feed we had a we had a dry uh a dry uh spring and summer particularly up high so it seems to me that the elk are more dispersed and they seem to be in general kind of spread out lower you know across the high country they're not all sitting at the top of the subalpine because there's no feed up there um so in this case, what I would, what I'm trying to find if I'm going to glass during the day is all my aspens are are basically leafless at this point. Like they're going to be in the next couple of days. Um, so if I can find areas where aspens hit timber, those those are tend to be good areas. One is your aspens tend to have better feed in them. You know, they, they, I mean, the dark, the real dark timber doesn't have any feed in, in it. Not why? Well. Why? Because of the light doesn't shine in there, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and it, I mean, you've probably experienced that. You've walked through an aspen grove and you realize that there's grass like knee high, right? Um, and then you go into the timber and there's like nothing. So if you can get into little little transition areas, for us, you know, around ten thousand feet, we lose our aspens. So anywhere where your little tim- your little timber um, hits the aspens, that's good. And then the other area is just where you got big fingers of fingers of timber that are on grassy slopes. You know, we don't really have avalanche slides, but they look like that. They look like little avalanche slides. Those tend to be good too. And part of that is, I mean, I know you're a big, you know, you're you're a big glasser, Jay. But a lot of it is, is if I'm looking at little strings of timber, it may not be that it's the best place, you know, where all the elk are, but it's where I can see. If I get the right angle, I can glass into those strings, right? Um, you know, there's some timber that's so thick, I mean, you know, I just don't have much luck picking up elk. And I know they're in there, you know, because, I, you know, you end up walking through areas just when you're navigating and you, you know, you, know you, you can smell elk or, you, or God forbid, you, hit, you, know, you jump them or whatever. So they're in those areas. But for me, when I'm glassing, I try not to waste a lot of time on areas that I know I can't see them in, you know what I mean? So for me, that's aspen to timber transition areas, and then just in the higher country, it's just the strings of timber on, like, grassy slopes. And what I'll find is that those elk will kind of stick to somewhere, even if it's just a very small opening, like on a steep hillside, they'll lay in that timber next to it, and then they'll just feed in it. Um, And guys will learn, you know, you can watch them. To me, elk always run, at least in our stuff, they run the thermals, right? So they're always going to be grazing into the thermals. And so that kind of affects how, how I glass, too. Explain that um, for some of the listeners out there that aren't as experienced. Uh, explain thermals, you know, in general. Explain exactly what you were just talking about. Okay, yeah. So, um, and it depends on your area how how consistent they are. But the easiest way for me to, to, rem- to remember it is that hot air rises, right? Um just like a hot air balloon, and I know it sounds probably dumb to people, but it's easy to forget, even after years of doing it, I always like try to think like, okay, how is this thermal going to change? Well, so hot air rises, so basically in the morning when you're hunting just the first half hour of light, you're going to have a downward thermal, right, because you've got your cold air from the night pulling that thermal down, and then once your sun comes up, you know, at like, it, you know, this time of year, it's going to be like 8 or 9, or maybe even a little bit before that. Once your sun comes up, starts warming that air up, it's going to start coming up. And what you'll see is those elk will, will use that. Like, they'll, they'll, sometimes they'll graze on the edge. You'll see them, they'll be grazing on the edge of, a, of like a slide. And then when that thermal changes, they're going to use that thermal to go back to their bed. So they'll turn into the thermal. And they'll, well, in this case, like let's say it's the morning. You see a you see an elk grazing. He's grazing, and the in the air's coming. Uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, the air's going down. He'll be pointed up, and he's he's using that thermal to smell. And then whenever it turns, he's going to use it to go back to his bed. Does that make sense, Jay? Yeah, and and in other words, as a defense mechanism, he wants to be smelling 
having as much scent coming to him as possible because that will help him detect him or her, yeah. uh, detect, uh, you know, predators, hunters, et cetera. And they've learned, uh, they've learned to do that, correct? Yeah. And so the, per- like the, the most blatant example is subalpine elk that like are right at the, that are living in the timber right at uh, timber line. In the mornings, you'll, you'll see them grazing out of that because the, the wind's coming down. And the minute that thermal changes, that now they can turn around and go back into their beds with the wind blowing right into their face. And then the extension of that that kind of goes outside of thermals, is, and it's like notorious. And I hear guys say it all the time. They're like, oh, we found these elk bedded, and then we decided to stock them. But, man, the wind is just shitty in that area. Yeah, well, that's why the elk are there. Because what they do is they'll use that thermal to go somewhere where the wind spins, right? And, and because they want to be, they want a bed where there's not really a consistent thermal. They want a bed where they can where they can smell from every direction. Does that make sense? Right. So they they like those swirly spots so that they can get more opportunity to have scent blow into their nostrils, and they they go, okay, that we've got problems. It, if they've got just a consistent, there's something can always sneak up on the on the downwind side right right so that's why like you know you got to be really careful about trying to kill elk in their in their beds right because typically there's a reason why they bed there (laughs) you know yeah for sure let's take a quick break here and i've got a question in regards to that Guys, the title sponsor of my podcast is GoHunt.com Insider, and they're doing a 30-day free trial exclusive for the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J. Scott and click on the blue free trial button and go through the steps. It only takes a couple of minutes. You will be required to provide a credit card, but you will not be charged until after the free 30 days. You can cancel at any time within the first 30 days to prevent being charged. If you have any questions at all, you can email freetrial at gohunt.com and someone from the GoHunt team will promptly respond. This is your opportunity to see what all the buzz is about and the filtering 2.0 system and the application strategies for the Western Hunter. Real Game Calls featuring the Elk Reel. Real Game Calls makes innovative, realistic, and easy-to-master calls using their proprietary, revolutionary design. They are located and manufactured in Gypsum, Colorado. Their calls were designed and battle-tested on some of the hardest-hunted terrain on Earth. Check out ElkReel.com. Use the promo code JSCOTT and receive a 20% discount on all purchases. Go to www.ElkReel.com. Okay, my question uh, is this. Let's say uh, in the morning, uh, you know, let's say it's opening morning or it doesn't really matter. It's it's a morning hunt. Uh, let's say that there's not anybody else around that you know of. You've got some elk and you're, you're, you're observing some elk. You can't shoot them from your position where you're at. You're glassing them. And, and they're working their way into the timber. You're looking, say, across the canyon or something, and they're working their way into the timber, and you can't get to them uh, and shoot at them, you know, that morning. Yeah. Uh, most guys are going to get impatient, I think, and try and go over there and force something to happen. What would someone like yourself that's hunted these things for so long and so much, what would you do for how would you position yourself for either, you know, the midday or the afternoon or the evening? What's your plan of attack? You know, uh, typically what I, what I would do in that situation, if I know there's not going to be, and this is going to be like a long answer, Jay, but um, if I know there's no one around that's also seen them or, you know, public's going to gonna affect them, which luckily for me, particularly up high, is not, not too much of an issue way in there. Um, usually I'll just watch where they bed and try to kill them that, that afternoon, right? And, and I basically just won't mess with them during the day um, just because of the wind, the wind deal. Um, so are, always, you saying, are you saying if you don't mess with them, the likelihood of them feeding out exactly in the same spot is highly likely? Yeah. 
It, it is. It is for sure. And it's it's very 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 unlikely if you go in there and bust them in their bed that you're going to ever see them again. <laughs> you know, what I mean, that's the right. that's what I would say is like the bigger you know, the bigger impactful thing on your decision is, yeah, they may not graze out into the exact same area, but if you get somewhere where you can watch them, um, you know, they may graze into a different meadow or, or whatever, and that, and that could be based on wind or, or just whatever. You know, they, they they don't go to the same spot every day, you know. Um, but the bigger deal is just the downside, right? Your downside risk is huge. Essentially, to me, and I'm not saying that I never do it, Jay, because there's lots of different reasons why you might do it. It could be the last day of your hunt. It could be that you feel like you can get close enough, um, you know, it just based on the geography where they're not going to detect you, you can shoot. You know, and particularly now, you know, I've got lots of guys that are comfortable shooting 450 yards. Um, you know, and so it's not like I don't do it, but if I'm going to, when I look at them and, like, we're going to make a play in their beds, I view it as, like, it's got to be really high potential to kill one or I'm not going to do it because it's like a binary outcome, right? You're either going to kill one or those elk are probably going to be gone. Like, I might, you know, I'm probably not going to see them during the hunt again. Right. You may blow it. You don't want to do something crazy early in the hunt. If you've got the whole hunt and nobody's around, you kind of – my experience, you kind of got to play it. You got to play the odds and you got to kind of gingerly, there's a time to be aggressive and then there's a time to play the odds and wait them out and get in a better position for the afternoon. If they don't feed out exactly where you need them, you know, you've got a leg up on the morning and, you know, try and, you know, do the same thing again the next day. Um, but I think, I think that's a good tip to, to, to tell people, you know, don't don't just charge in guns blazing bayonets fixed and the whole thing you know sure. in my mind observing them trying to figure out what they're going to do and make your next move based on all of the information that you're gathering yeah no i think that's huge and particularly uh in first season right because they they i mean in particularly this year cuz they've been they've been they haven't been messed with in almost 3 weeks you know, they, they are, they're living like a pattern right now. Right. Um, so I think what you're saying is even more valid, Jay, like they're, they're living like elk do, you know, the end of third season after we've had, if we've had three and a half feet of snow and they're running down the low country. Yeah. I mean, it's different, right. Cause they're just, they're like, they're like ping pong balls, you know? Um, right. so, so that's a, that's a little bit different, but I would say, you know, early first season for sure or any time of the time time of the rifle seasons if they're in a real remote area you know um it, you, you know if you're seeing them a couple days in a row in the same spot they're, they're probably living there you know so there's no point in screwing it up let's talk about that ping pong mentality and i've seen it a lot uh, as the season you know into third and fourth season when they've been harassed and shot at and you know chased all over the world um does your strategy as far as being aggressive or being passive and and observing um as the seasons progress does your does your strategy and your your aggressiveness change um talk a little bit about that and and talk a little bit about those that ping pong you know just a uh you know um Pinball, that's what I'm thinking, yeah, the pinball. Yeah, I, the yeah, and, I just, use, and I use the wrong term, but yeah. Pinball yeah, the, is the idea. pinball where they're just bouncing everywhere. Um, talk a little bit about that. And I know it's like, um, it's kind of, I asked you three different questions there. but no, that's all right. I've, I, I I've, seen elk where, <laughs> I, I've seen elk when they get shot at, like the whole group. You could have all of a sudden like 100 elk or 50 elk come just barreling out of the timber and they're just running and talk a little bit about you know if you've got you know you and your buddy and you're both trying to fill either you know cow tag or bull tag or what have you um you know how that p pinball men mentality plays plays into your into your favor or against you yeah so um so it's, just, it's kind of a reality is over the counter units particularly if conditions get really good you know to kill them like you got cold you got deep snow, all that stuff. That's when you're really, 
if the if the country's all still opened up, right, like and they can go anywhere, it it's not as extreme as people think. I mean, basically the elk will go hole up, right? They'll go hole up in somewhere nasty they know they're safe. Um but once you have the real elk killing conditions, um, yeah, I mean, you just can be sitting any time of day looking at some south-facing slope and 80 elk can just come running across it. Well, they're not running for no reason. You know, they're coming out of somewhere else. And uh, I know for a fact, um, and I used to always be told this, um, like from my, my dad was an outfitter and he used to always say it, you know, that these elk will, you know, if you shoot at them, they can go 10 miles or 15 miles or whatever. And I'm not sure that, you know, I don't think that they just run straight for 10, 15 miles. However, I do know that once they start getting harassed, they will do it. And the the piece of evidence I have is I had a bull in my area that his whole beam was flipped over. And he was a, he was a big, he was a big six by six, which is, which is pretty rare for these over the counter units anyways, like a, you know, 300 inch plus elk. And his whole beam was dropped down, like not an elk, like it, he's pretty identifiable. And in a, in a friend uh, outfitter of mine, that his closest camp is probably 16, 17 miles from me. We saw him. We saw him one week, and eight days later, one of his hunters killed him. So that elk, and it wasn't based on snow or anything, anything like that. It was just based on pressure. You know, he moved, you know, almost 20 miles and got killed. So they will, they will move. The benefit of of it obviously is is if you're in an area, like the guys that are coming out and they've got their camp in an area, if the conditions are good like that, where you know people in the, you know, in that area are going to kill elk, like you got deep snow, um, if you're not seeing elk, it could just be a matter of time, you know, because they can come in there, you know. So that's, I would say that's the upside, Jay. Um, but I would say that, you know, in, in, in that world, when you see them, you really gotta you really gotta kill them, right? Um, because they're there and they're then they're probably gone. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna see a lot of stuff where you know they 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 came in yesterday um, and then you know you saw them feeding in the meadow and then you're gonna kill them in that same meadow the next day. There's less of that when, when conditions get like that. Um, you you do need to be I would say much more aggressive. Um, in, in when that's when that's occurring. It's good stuff. Um, I, I got a question from a listener that was asking me about etiquette with outfitters. Um, yeah. He was asking me, he says, Jay, do you think, I'm paraphrasing, Jay, do you think it would be best to go and introduce myself and ask the, the the outfitter on the trailhead, or or if, you know, if, if if I run into them with a string of, you know, horses and clients, is it better to ask them where they're going, or tell them where I'm going, and how should I handle that? And I, and I'm curious from your perspective. I mean, I I kind of told them that it's like this. I mean, if if an outfitter's in an area. He obviously is getting paid and, and a guy like yourself, you know, you want your clients to be successful and then you've got DIY guys that are, you know, walking in on foot or, or have their own stock or what have you. You know, I think it's best to, you know, communicate and to kind of, you know, say, yeah, we're kind of working this basin. Um, but I told him that, you know, don't expect if you're a DIY guy that some outfitter is just going to pull up his camp and say, yeah, we won't go in there. Cause you know, a lot of these camps, you know, by, by force ser- service regulation, I think you're required to be in certain camps in certain areas and what have you. So right. as a DIY hunter, I think I would gain local knowledge of where those outfitter camps are. And if it were me, I would probably try and go in other drainages where maybe it's it's further away from the outfitters, you know, uh, camps. But I was curious, kind of your thoughts on the whole thing. Uh, yeah, I'm like the yeah. So I got. The, I mean, I'd I'd say kind of two things. I, well, the first thing I'd say is I get calls all the time from guys that they're going to come into the area. They call me. Um, they know I operate in the the two or three main drainages here. And uh, I'm honestly, like, just transparent with them, you know, where I have camps. Because to me, it's mutually beneficial to both of us, right? Um, so I don't mind it, uh, you know, um, 
the, I would say that people, so I don't, you know, people, uh, to me that's just a courtesy and it's a nice thing for them to do. They're going to come, they're telling me I can exchange information with them. Typically, you know, typically they want to know if we can pack uh, dead elk out, um, out for them or whatever. So there's like a mutually beneficial thing typically. And I, to me that's polite and that's, that's nice to do. Um, I would say that like in general, and it's, um, I think guys that are doing it themselves, they shouldn't expect anything more than that when they talk to an outfitter, right? Um, it, that's the only, I think the, the do-it-yourself hunter sometimes thinks like all outfitters are assholes because we won't give them much more info, but we just, you know, it's, we're, I mean, you know, we're not going to tell you like a lot about the area because we, we are, you know, kind of our loyalty is to our paying customer, right? Um, so don't right. construe that as as outfitters being mean or rude or whatever. It's just part of the part of the thing. But I, I think in terms of like exchanging information on you know where we're hunting and stuff like that, I think that's more more than fair. Um, the, well, uh, I I, go ahead. I have one more thing to add there. I think it's kind of interesting that people, a DIY guy, you know, in outfits, somebody that's going in there all summer long and they're making trips in and out, in and out, in and out, and they really know the area and they're learning the area and that, you know, but for someone to say, oh yeah, first season starts on Saturday and I haven't scouted at all and I'm showing up here Friday at the trailhead, you know, tell me where to go. Well, I'm a believer in you have to provide value and bring something to the table in exchange rather than just have a one way, you know, uh, you know, some people call with and expect that you're going to tell them something and it just doesn't work that way. I mean, uh, my response, if someone asked me and, you know, I don't run a string of horses or I'm not an outfitter in that per- perspective, sure. but it's kind of like, why, you know, I've been working all summer to get my camps ready, get, you know, I'm the one cleaning the trail. I'm the one doing all this stuff. Why am I going to just give you the, you know, golden goose and tell you, yeah, go to this coordinate and, you know, look across (laughs) the canyon and there'll be a group of elk standing there. I mean, I I, I see both sides as a third party. Um, Yeah, yeah, it's it's a tough one. But like what you're saying, I mean, in the last 10 days, I mean, I've had four or five calls just just wanting that. And and I I get it, people, you know, they're trying to do their internet research on it. And I I don't mind talking to people because what we end up doing is we don't talk about hunting, we end up talking about camps and stuff like that. So it's a good exchange information, but there is kind of, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, what people will say. Like, I, I've actually had people call and say, hey, like, I, will you tell me where you're guiding out of? Because if we, you know, if we have a problem, we'd love to, we'd love to know where you're at so we, so we can come over and get, you know, get help. Um, that's just not how it works, you know, Jay. <laughs> yeah. Not to say that I'm not going to help people, but you can't. You know, because that's just what you do when you, you know, when you're in the mountains, you help each other. It doesn't matter who you are, but like you can't plan that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm not. Yeah, just, I mean. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, you're not just gonna come. You know, oh yeah, I'll pack out. You know, you got two elk down. I'll just pack them out for you. I mean, it's like if if you want me to do that, we have to have an agreement prior, set it up, and and that's what that's how you make your living. Yeah. So it's not like you come to the rescue. It, it, it's yeah. I mean, people need to really think about it. It's 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 almost like saying, you know, I don't want to pay you to maintain my truck, but when my truck does break down, uh, I'll call you to come get me. It, it, you know, it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, if you yeah, were a yeah, mechanic, no, it's, it's like, yeah. And and I don't think and I don't think anybody has bad intentions. You know, I just think they don't think about it that way. You know what I mean, Jay? Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and not to get totally off topic, but I think that's like a super important one during archery. Because I've had guys that have run into me um, with, I mean, you know, they've, they've, they've gone way deep, you know, like six, seven hour horseback ride into the backcountry. And then they kill an elk in 70 degree weather and they run into me. I don't have pack animals. I can't help them. I'm guiding hunters. That elk is going to go bad. And so, and I've had that happen several times and that's devastating for everybody. Right. And so, yeah. so I always, to me, that's just a good thing for people to think about, right? Like you got to really have a plan, you know, particularly when you get way, way back in there. Um, so that's, you know, one of those things that's just, 
I, I think it's more just people thinking about it. I don't think anybody's like has a bad intention about it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, in, in terms of like your, your listeners questions, I think talking to outfitters is, I mean, every guy I know, um, for the most part is going to be nice to the public. Um, I mean, in the end, I think people construe it differently because we're busy. You know, we're not gonna we're not gonna talk to you for 45 minutes on the trail and and stuff like that. I mean, we'll chat briefly, but usually, we, unfortunately, we have something to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. So, but I think you know calls beforehand and stuff. I always appreciate that from from guys. And the the only other thing I'll say about it is I I do you hit on a point that people don't realize, and that's that as a do it yourself guy. Um, you have more flexibility than an outfitter does a lot, right? <laughs> to change your game plan. Um, we can't change our game plan for the most part, right? We have, you know, we have better, you know, really good gear. Typically we're guiding off horses and that sort of thing. So we have more flexibility in that sense, but where our camp is, um, you know, how many people we're going to have in our camp and all that stuff, that's, that's just set, you know? So, um, we don't have the flexibility to change that. Um, and I don't think people realize that a lot because it's kind of like, well, you know, if unfortunately if, if guys have gone into an area, put their camp in five days before the season, um, and <clears throat> they've been scouting and everything else, um, and then we come in three days later, we're putting that camp where we got to put it. And it, in that, because we just don't have legal flexibility, you know what I mean? Right. And so, whereas a DIY guy can really, they don't, they're not under the same restrictions and regulations as as someone like yourself that's permitted and what have you. You have to be in specific areas. Yeah, yeah. So, and and I always in and I always post all my camps like in the summer just so guys know. But you know, in in other areas, if you go into an area and you see cut poles like big long poles sitting up in a tree. Uh, you see that there's clearly been wall tents there and stuff like that, you, you might want to be a little cautious about putting your camp there. You know what I mean? Um, just because whoever, if that's an outfitter camp, there's a good chance it's going to show up, you know. So it's just one of those things. It's unfortunate, but it's just the reality of, how, you know, our, our structure, right? For sure. Let's talk a little bit about gear. Um through the seasons, you know, with the first season starting and, and as it progresses through fourth season, and I know we could probably have about five podcasts on this, but in general, um, what should guys be expecting to, to, to be wearing? What are important things that, you know, reasons why there's certain pieces of gear, you know, from, from you know, keeping your head warm, to, you know, your feet warm, whatever, what's important in your mind? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's just it's just ha- having plenty of layers, Jay. Um, that's the that's the main thing because you're talking like huge, you know, huge um, uh, temperature swings. Um, and then I've moved completely over to to basically merino wool, and then um, and then I didn't I have certain layers that are, you know, I have a like usually like a like a puffy or like a down jacket. You know, is one of my layers. Um, I, I wear merino wool uh, base layers all the time, um, and then a lot of that has to do for me. Uh, I haven't been like I don't have a, anything wrong with synthetics. I use them for years, but um, basically, it's just when you're in a camp for seven or eight days, it's just you don't build up, you know, the smell and that sort of thing with the wool. Um, and then I just make sure I have always when I go out in the morning, I have you know, a couple, and typically it's like a, one of those down lightweight jackets. I'll have that in my pack in case I end up being there at, you know, late into the night, uh, with a dead elk or whatever. So I always have a couple extra layers that are in my pack. Um, I carry really heavy duty rain gear. Um, part of that is, uh, obviously for the rain, but part of it is I just consider it like an extra layer if I need it. And I, and I, uh, for, I think I've been using it for like three years. I use Kuyu's Yukon stuff. Um, it's probably overdoing it, so, you know, sometimes. But for me, if I get in a bind, I can, you know, put on my extra layers, have that on top, even if it's not raining, and I'll stay warm. Um, so in terms of clothing, that's where, where I go. Um, you know, some suggestions, and this is, I mean, 
it's kind of outside the the spectrum of like the the real high end gear. But for years, I would go into like thrift stores in Aspen, Vail, and these places, and I'd buy everything that was wool, you know, just as just as layers. Um, could be just you know, it's just like an inexpensive way to make sure I had plenty of that sort of stuff. As long as you stick with you know the non cotton stuff and particularly wool, you know, you can have pretty pretty good gear that way. Now I don't have the limitations on weight that a lot of guys do, so that, that plays in you know, that plays in a lot on that. Um but I would say on clothing that's that's my main thing. Do you have any specific questions on that? Yeah, I mean um how important guys I'm sure ask you all the time, you know, what kind of boots should they wear? Um, and you know, should they have insulation in the boots? Uh, you know, what kind of socks, um, you know, do you wear toe warmers? Do you wear any of that kind of stuff? How important is some of that stuff? Yeah. So on, on boots, um, the main thing from my perspective is, well, not the main thing, but one of the big things that guys forget is I just like to have more than one pair of them, um, in case one of them gets wet. Um, part of that's a comfort thing. Part of it is just you know, keeping yourself hunting if you got a wet pair of boots is, is tough. Um, what I do in my rifle seasons is I'm, like, right now I'm still wearing essentially, like, uh, you know, a, an insulated hiking boot, um, and then I wear gaiters on it, and then I'm always wearing a liner sock and then a wool sock over it. Um, and so, and then immediately once I go to deep snow, I start wearing pack boots. Um, and that's... You know, if you're going to hunt a lot of the second, third, fourth rifle seasons, probably investing in a pair of pack boots is the way to go. Just because it has, you know, you can wear a wool liner uh, or you can wear a wool sock, but then it also has wool liners in them. And you can, instead of having two pairs of boots, you can just have multiple pairs of those liners. Um, so I would say those are the main thing. I, I mean, in the end, my feet do get a little cold, particularly if I'm just sitting in glassing forever. Um so it just, but I haven't really found like a like a functional uh, solution to that. I've never actually tried foot warmers or anything like that. That's for sissies, huh? Well, well I mean, I just never have tried it. <laughs> to be honest, it's just like you know, even though we do pack all of our stuff in on horses, it's just another thing to carry. You know, yeah. it's just another thing you got to take with you, and it hasn't been a big big problem for me. Um, but there's a bunch of variations of those pack of pack boots that people should consider. You know, the the challenge with it is if you're only going on one rifle elk hunt, you know, every couple years or something, it's kind of hard to invest in a pair of pack boots. So Let's take a quick break here. PhoneScope is a company that makes custom-molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. It is simple to text photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. Get yours now by using the JSCOT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at PhoneScope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E.com or on Instagram, at PhoneScope. I have known the owners of the Outdoorsmans in Phoenix for over 20 years. They are the authority on optics and hunting gear. Outdoorsmans is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods, mounting accessories, and pack systems for all hunters. Their customer service is the best in the business. Go to Outdoorsmans.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any products. Okay, I want to finish today's episode and talk a little bit about um, shooting and shooting at elk and what you tell your clients as far as, you know, make your first shot count, but what happens if things go awry? I mean, do you shoot till they're down? Um, You know, I'd, I'd like to hear, you know, kind of what you tell your guys because you've seen bulls wounded you've seen everything under the sun and and kind of get your uh take on you know shot prep kind of kind of walk me through your whole process and and kind of your thinking once you start shooting at an elk yeah so the for me it kind of is as a guide it starts a little bit earlier than that usually i have a discussion with a guy and i guess the um 
the analogy to it for someone that's doing it on their own, they should really think about this before they do it. Um, is how how you're going to shoot? Are you going to shoot on my backpack? Are you going to plan on shooting on that bipod that you've got attached to your gun? Are we? You know how how do you feel comfortable shooting? And we work out that before the situation arises. That probably sounds like obvious to people, but it doesn't happen. You know what I mean? A lot of times people are trying to figure that all out, like when when they see elk or they get close to elk. So you need to figure that out. And, like, it could be that, okay, we're in sagebrush. Your bipod is short. It's pretty much useless, right? We need to do the backpack thing or we need to figure out a different solution. So you can you need to think about that, like, when you're in the terrain that you're hunting. So to me, that's a big a big part of it. Um, and it also just, like, it doesn't get people all antsy when they're, when they're going to take a shot, right? It's like one less thing to worry about. We just know, you know, you're going to shoot in my backpack. I'll have it ready for you, get you all set up, right? <laughs> so people should think about that. Um, and then uh, I know you, you asked, like, a multiple, multiple-part question on it. but um, <laughs> I <yeah>. always do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first part. I haven't even started the question, but that's like the prep. As I always have that discussion with guys. And then I tell guys in – and I, it's actually the same thing I tell guys on goats, on mountain goat hunting, is the same thing I tell guys on elk. And that's because those two animals, and from my perspective, can take a bullet better than anything, and they can get up, and they can run off, and you can not find them. And, and other stuff, for the most part, when it, you shoot it and it hits the ground, watch it. Yeah, sure, if it gets up, you know, kill it, but you're probably pretty much fine, right? Um, but for me, on goats and elk, I say, make the first shot, kill him, right? I'm going to call the shot and tell you, like, okay, yeah, you hit him, you hit him in the chest, you, probably, you, you double-lunged him, you're going to kill him. But to me, if that elk is not on the ground, just keep, keep, keep trying to kill him until he's on the ground, right? And I've had several elk get up, you hit them, they fall down, they get up, and then they start running. And so the same thing to me, shoot him until they're dead dead right um and to me that's even if you shoot one you know you hit him perfect double lunged him and he's standing upright looking at you just shoot him again um you know there's not you it's minimal meat thing it's not worth you know you don't really know 100 percent for sure where you've hit him so just kill him to me that's the the biggest deal on it um and then and 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 a que- a follow-up question to that is you and I have seen it a lot where they knock them down, they're rolling around, and you're like, okay, you got them. I like to stay in the gun for like a minute or so and just watch them through the scope and be ready in case he does get up. I've seen it before where, boom, he goes down and people are high-fiving and they're out of the gun. And the next thing you know, you're looking through the binos and going, he's up, he's up, he's up. How, you know... Do oh, you, yeah. by by discipline, make the guy stay in the gun and watch the elk and, and be ready in case he does get up and, and give it, you know, a minute or two and then and then high five? Yeah, so to me, we, I mean, we do the same thing. Because I've, wor- I've actually had a worse deal happen where everybody gets up and then you start walking over and they're not there. You know what I mean? Like you're talking like total, it was dead and now you're walking to it, and then all of a sudden you get, and it's like, where'd it go, right? Well, when you were sitting there uh, not paying attention, it got up and stumbled off, right? Uh, in the one situation I had, I mean, we, we found them, but it's still like, oh, wow, you know, who, we, you're not even seeing where it goes, right? So, so I, I would totally agree with you on that, um, and that's what I do, particularly as a guide. I think it's hard for people who know they have, have shot something, even if you tell them to sit and look and make sure uh, they do tend to tend on getting off their gun, but if you can if you can have the um, the discipline to do that, that's better. Just wait, you know, <clears throat> and and just watch in your scope. Um, when I'm guiding guys, I mean, I always will sit with binoculars and just wait, 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 right? Um, and then I'll just remind guys to 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 you know to reload their gun and get ready, right? Um, before before like a bunch of celebratory stuff. <laughs> so. You know, I think I. I mean, that's a that's a good point with them for sure. Awesome. Well, what's your um, prognosis for uh, the upcoming season? Uh, you know, 
sounds like first season you got a little bit more chance when the elk are kind of just in their pattern and they're not too jostled around. Um, how how are things looking? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think we'll do well. Um, you know, the last couple of years we've done well uh, first season too, so I'm not too concerned about. It. And I, I I don't want to like jinx myself, but I think we'll do better in the last couple of years just because the elk seem to be more dispersed um, based on I think it's feed. But uh, and we've been seeing more, and we've been scouting and packing and that sort of thing. So I think I think it'll be pretty good year, even though we're going to have what looks like to be a pretty warm first season in mild temperatures. I think we'll do just as good, if not better, than we have the last couple of years. Do you see the elk? Uh, you think they'll still be bugling at all, or what's your thoughts there? Yeah, you know it's a it's a good question. I was I was talking to the the same guy I mentioned before, um, and. Uh, I, I mean, I would expect it's like a little tail end of the rut. And, you know, I, I've talked to several guys that, uh, that work, uh, you know, work with pen, pen, you know, pen delk in Colorado, and a lot of them are backing out, you know, what, based on when the calves are being born in the last couple of years, backing out when these cows are being bred. And it's like, you know, between the 6th and 15th of October, you know, a good portion of them. So they got to be... I mean, there's got to be a little rutting activity still going on. So it wouldn't surprise me. You know, last year we had it, but the season was a week early, uh, you know, a week earlier than now. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little bit still going on. For sure. And for those guys with the the third and fourth rifle elk seasons, um, with it being later this year, those could be pretty darn good hunts because of the probably colder temperatures and you know elk being a little bit more susceptible as far as out feeding and a little you know a little bit more vulnerable don't you think yeah yeah no i think it's a good it'll be a good year particularly deer guys in the third and fourth season i guess i i would i would i would guess we'll, we'll do real well on deer awesome so did the did you get to experience a good uh leaf uh color change up there with the aspens this year was it awesome yeah it was good a little bit early but uh it was we had good colors this year, you know, probably like a week earlier than last year. But it always is, and I'm looking out my door, and they're just at the very last tail end of falling off right now. So it feels like fall. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's Well, I always love uh, following you on your Instagram posts, and uh, uh, you do a really good job of capturing kind of what your uh, outfitting business is all about, and I appreciate that. Um and kudos for for working so hard and in you know putting up some of those photos kind of showing people how how your operation works um so what's the deal you've got uh, guys already packed in and you've got some guided trips that you're going to be packing in uh today or tomorrow yes yeah, so i packed in uh, i packed in a couple camps yesterday we packed in a couple camps this morning i got one camp going in this afternoon and then i got all my guided stuff going in tomorrow so it's always like a First season, because it's only five days, uh, everybody kind of goes in at the same time. Everybody comes out at the same time, so it's a bit of a logistical nightmare. But, uh, um, but we've had good weather, and it's been good. Good. All the crew's been working hard and stuff, so I can't, I can't complain. Awesome. So you do drop camps uh, where guys, you basically just take them in, and they, they work it from there. And then you also do fully guided uh, where you, you and your guides are actually taking guys out and, and you know, not only cooking and, and providing camp, but actually taking them elk hunting as well, correct? Yep, yep. We do the whole whole deal. And, and a lot of my guided stuff is actually like corporate groups. You know, like a, there'll be a group of guys from the same company or whatever, and it's kind of like a corporate, um, you know, outing for them, so, uh, which makes it pretty fun um, for businesses that got a fair amount of hunters in it. So that's, that's what most of our guided stuff migrated to. For sure, it's... Um probably a lot of good trash talking and a lot of good fun in, in those camps for sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. I mean, even if it gets, you know, it's almost like some of those guys like it if it's rougher just because I think they're like hazing their, uh, their more junior employees, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, looks like you had some good, uh, mountain goat hunting. Yeah, yeah, we had, uh, yeah, I guided two guys. We killed two goats, um, and then one of my uh, kind of like my assistant guide here, he went and did one by himself and killed another one. So it was good. And you know, we had really good. I had like the guys I guided this year, particularly those those first two goats. Um, they're they're just like guys in super good shape, uh, and we had a good time. Uh, and they both killed good goats. So it was fun. You know, the goat hunting. Have you ever gone, Jay? 
I haven't. Yeah, it's a good. I mean, it's a fun one. Do you put in for the draw and all that? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a it's a different hunt. They're like a they're such a unique animal, but uh, it takes you to some wild uh, some wild stuff, you know. Um, you're even above the sheep when you're looking for goats in Colorado, aren't you? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. Like all those goats, I'd say um, all three of them were killed between 12 and 13 to 5 um, and all that you know, that pretty rugged, rugged, rocky stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it, for, on, you know, on the goat hunting, most of it is getting up there and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. To, you know, the, the reason I like it is because every single goat is like a true spot and stock hunt, right? Goats don't get shot off the road. You don't you don't randomly walk into goats. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So that's what I what I really enjoy about it, you know. Okay, I had to finish here on the uh you're probably too busy to even know, but uh, I had to give you a little bit of a hard time. What's going on with your Stanford Cardinals? Uh they're three and two and my Sun Devils are five and one. I just had to br- had to bring that up. Uh I can't even comment on it to be honest with you. Um <laughs> You know, <laughs> you're right. Like I'm completely out of the loop for this time of year. But what am I going to say, Jay? Yeah. When you went to Stanford, did you end up? Did you go to any of the football games? Yeah, yeah. We. I used to. I mean, you know, that's it's a pretty active. Uh, I mean, not as much as you guys are, but like most people, you know, sports is a big deal there. So I would, I would go. Um, but you know, they weren't very good when I was there. So yeah. you know, a little bit of the momentum uh, wasn't as much there when when I was around, but uh, but I used to go to a lot of the sports activities because they got a bunch of big, you know, a lot of the other stuff, even the non-football stuff is is big there. So um, yeah, you know how I mean, it's nice to go to school where that's a big part of it. I I find it hard to believe with as academically tough as Stanford is that that they actually have had good football teams because it just seems like you know that that's a you know academics is huge there and and sports but i mean they've had over the last few years they've had some unbelievable teams uh yeah, speaking mean, about football and and not saying that football players are dumb at all I'm, my nephew's probably going to give me a hard time and be like what the <laughs> heck uncle you're calling us all dumb but i mean no i get, uh, what, you're, I get what you're saying though like just like the limitations on but um, just in terms of time and everything else, these yeah. guys are like like epic athletes in high school. So how are they how are they accomplishing both? You know, it's it's interesting. Like I, you know, I, I, there uh, when you go to school there, you know, you almost all the kids live in dorms. Uh, you know, they all live on campus. So I lived with a bunch of football players and stuff, and uh, they're just like smart, high achieving guys. And so in some ways, I think probably a lot of those guys it's correlated, right? They're smart. Yeah. And that that same dedication is like uh, you know is uh, goes goes long on their uh, on their sport activities you know for but. sure for sure well buddy thanks for spending some time with us um, I want to give you a chance to let the listeners know how they can find you um, and encourage the listeners to check out uh, Cliff's website he's got a great website um, where where can guys find you Cliff yeah so the easiest way to get to the website is ft as in flat tops, and then guides. So ftguides with an s dot com, and then the I'd say the main social media deal is my Instagram, and that's Cliff C L I F F G R Y. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I uh, I try to keep try to keep those updated, and then you can just click through on my Facebook and stuff on the website. So that's all on there. And, and uh, actually, ever since being on your show, I'm getting a lot more interaction, which is kind of nice. Um, you know, I get, it's amazing how many people communicate through those avenues now, you know? Well, you know, when you have 50 million listeners, it's bound to happen, right? <laughs> you're up here right now, it's not right. I wish, I wish, but, uh, I've got a great loyal support, uh, group here listening and, um, yeah, I get a lot of great feedback from them. So, um, buddy, thanks. It was awesome. Have, have a great couple of seasons here. Um, you know your bread and butter. You know your your seasons right here in front of you. You've got the next uh, two months, uh, October and November, and and uh, enjoy it and uh, be safe. And I'll be uh, chatting at you and and uh, shooting you some texts here and there. Okay. All right, we'll do. Thanks, Jay. All right, buddy. Take care.